Good evening, everyone out there on Zoom. If you're joining us for tonight's book club program, you're in the right place. We are going to be starting in just a moment or so. Uh, we're going to be gathering the, the guests here in the club rooms, and then we will begin. So just sit back, relax for a few minutes, and uh, we will be starting shortly. Thank you. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to this co-presentation by the Book Club of California, the Bibliographical Society of America, and the American Trust for the British Library. This is an in-person and virtual program titled The Newly Discovered Notebook of Isaac Newton. My name is Kevin Kosick, and I'm the Executive Director for the Book Club of California. It's my pleasure to welcome you all this evening here in person and on Zoom. For those of you who are new to us, the Book Club of California is a nonprofit member and donor supported organization that is dedicated to preserving and promoting the history of the book and the book arts. Oftentimes we do that with a focus on the history and the literature of California and the West. The Book Club publishes limited edition books, a scholarly journal and keepsakes. We host a year round series of exhibitions and programs like the one this evening on topics including fine printing, design, typography, bookbinding, collecting, history, and much, much more. Now, if you're interested in what we do, please consider joining our century long tradition. Our, our membership dues are modest, but the benefits are many, and we simply can't do the work of the book club without the support of our members and our donors. So for more information about the book club, you can visit us online at bccbooks.org. Now, in terms of the logistics for tonight's program, uh, we will have a presentation about 40, 45 minutes long, and then a Q&A session right after. If you have questions or comments for our presenter or about the presentation, please use the chat and the Q&A functions in Zoom. We should have time at the end of the hour to take questions from chat uh, on Zoom and from here, the live audience at the book club. Now, as I mentioned earlier, today's presentation is the result of a collaboration between the Book Club of California, the American Trust for the British Library, and the Bibliographical Society of America. I'm pleased to introduce Bibliographical Society of America's council member, Andrew Nadell. Thank you very much, Kevin. Before we start, I would again, as, as we did in the previous lectures, uh, thank Kevin for uh, doing everything to put this together. Um, without the support of the book club, I don't think we would be having these lectures in San Francisco. Um, I, I'm Andrew Nadell. I've been a member of the book club. Oh, okay, sorry. Can you hear me? Barely. Barely? Is that better? Yeah, okay. I think I knocked the thing off it, but anyway, um, I've been a member of the Book Club in California for almost 45 years. And I am very pleased that the uh, Bibliographical Society of America and the American Trust for the British Library are sponsoring this lecture in cooperation with the Book Club. This is the third in a series of lectures with sponsorship of these national organizations. The uh, PSA and the ATBL would be pleased to welcome members of the book club and other people watching tonight around the world to join them in promoting the world of bibliography and bibliophily. This evening, we are most fortunate to have as our speaker, Scott Mandelbrot of Peterhouse, Cambridge, who is frankly among the most foremost scholars of English books. I must tell you that he is also a bibliomaniac. <laughs> he just loves books. He has a collection of early books, early English, mostly English books of extraordinary importance and extraordinary size. I visited him uh, twice, I think, at Peter House, and much of his collection is kept at the college. When he came to Oxford, from Oxford to Cambridge, where he is director of studies and, and the Pern and Ward librarian, he arranged for space for his collection. The books are housed in bookcases so tall 
and the aisles so close together that the floor underneath the room had to be reinforced. <laughs> it's hard for us ordinary collectors to imagine how he could have such a huge collection of the period before the 18th century. His work and his books are about books themselves, the scientific revolution and pseudoscience, the life and writings of intellectuals and divines, religion and religious conflict. He's interested in the transmission of knowledge, who read what and when, the provenance, the annotations, and the book bindings. He's interested in the printing and distribution of books in England and the European continent and beyond. Scott knows about books as objects, the people who read them and their subsequent owners. As I said, he is an avid collector, and avid is not a strong enough word. <laughs> He manages to discover in books aspects unknown to their current owners, to auction houses and to dealers, aspects often ignored for hundreds of years. At Peter House, he teaches undergraduates and advises doctoral students of history. He's in charge of the Newton Project, part of which he will speak tonight. He supports the Cambridge Bibliographical Society, encouraging young students in their collecting. He is a member of the Association Internationale de Bibliophilie and the Grolier Club. But I discovered he does not have a Wikipedia page. <laughs> I have a friend, however, who lives in Europe who writes them as a hobby, and I'm going to ask him to remedy the situation. <laughs> you have no choice. <laughs> <laughs> you did one for Eleanor. However, if you search for Scott on Wikipedia, exactly 39 articles appear referring to him. 39 articles. I wonder if that is a coincidence or the work of some guardian angel, angel with Anglican sensibilities. Having noticed that Scott is interested in the role of the church in 17th century England. He is also, it is unbelievable. He's also a member of a most distinguished family. After graduating from Eton College, he went up to Oxford, where his father and his grandfather had also studied. His father was Bertram Mandelbrot, the psychiatrist, among the foremost English advocates for community and social psychiatry in the 20th century. I had heard of him long before I heard of Scott, uh, in psychiatry. His grandfather was Harry Mandelbrot, who was a professor of constitutional history and law in Cape Town. His brother is Giles Mandelbrot, who spoke to this audience in 2022 and is the librarian of the Warburg Institute. There is a Mandelbrot Drive in Littlemore in Oxford. Unlike the little tiny street in San Francisco called Nidel Court, the history of which seems to be unknown, Mandelbrot Drive was named for Scott's father for his contributions to the hospital, Littlemore Hospital and to the community there. So tonight I have great pleasure in introducing my friend, Scott Mann. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Drew. And um, thank you very much also to the Book Club of California and the Bibliographical Society of America and the American Friends of the British Library for the invitation to come and talk here this evening. Um, I'm going to talk to you about um, something I found um, in uh, the middle of a rather difficult period in English history, in other words, a period of time when everyone was confined to their houses. I took advantage of um, the legal possibilities of travelling for work um, to go down on an empty train to London to visit an auction house to have a look at a book that they were offering. And that's the book I'm going to talk to you about. So I'm going to talk to you about a good thing that came out of the COVID pandemic. The best thing being um, that the University of Cambridge was able to buy the book I'm going to talk to you about. So if you want to have a look at it, it's now MS Ad uh, 10,345 in the Cambridge University Library. Um, and uh, Really, what I'm going to do is try and talk you through 
what might be thought of as a bibliographical puzzle, which is to think about um, what was it I saw? How did I know it was what I thought it was? Can I convince you that I'm right and that I'm not mad? Um, and what might some of the significance of that be? So I'm going to start with a slide, which is the slide on the screen, um, which is there really to make you think a little bit about whether or not I'm mad, um, which is to say it's a slide um, which shows two things. Um, the first thing, thanks to my friend Nick Wilding, is um, a forgery, a manuscript attributed to Galileo, now thought to have been written in the 20th century by Tobia Nicotra, uh, and on paper which was made some 150 years after Galileo's death. Um, Galileo, of course, died just about the same time that Newton was born, so one can see if one has theories about the transmigration of souls, then this, this you know, works, works nicely. Um, and um, the picture on the bottom right of the screen is from one of a number of notebooks of Isaac Newton's, um, which uh, I was going to show you some more, but the clicker doesn't work, so I'll show you some more this way, um, which are all part of the major collection, or almost all, part of the major collection of uh, Newton material, which is held by the Cambridge University Library and was given to that library in um, the 1860s, catalogued in 1872, um, by the Earl of Portsmouth, who was uh, one of Newton's direct heirs or sort of slightly indirect heirs because Newton didn't have any children, but nevertheless, a direct line from Newton's heirs, his half niece, Catherine Barton and her husband, John Conduit. And those notebooks include not only Newton's uh, drawings of his observations of comets in Cambridge in the 1660s, uh, they also include his alchemical recipes, his recipes for various um, kinds of medicine, his expense accounts as a student. Um, on the right, the waste book that he took over from his um, stepfather, Barnabas Smith, in which his stepfather made notes for his sermons and in which Newton made notes of his discoveries leading to the calculus. Um, other notebooks that Newton kept uh, include on the bottom left hand side, uh, a notebook that he kept, a very small notebook actually, that he kept when he was um, a student uh, in Grantham before he, at the uh, grammar school in Grantham, uh, before he went up to Cambridge um, in um, 1661 and went up to Trinity College in Cambridge, which is where um, these notebooks continue to be kept and continue to be written by Newton and where I hope to show you that another notebook was also written. Um, so this is a talk about, about notebooks. It's a talk about a notebook associated with a man who kept notebooks. Um, but what sort of notebook is it? Well, that's still not working. Um, who are the people, to begin with, who are the people who I'm going to talk about? Um, they are principally two people. Uh, one man, uh, Isaac Newton, who you can see on the left here in the earliest portrait of him painted by Nella, probably about a um, decade after I'm the events that I'm going to talk about. Um, Newton there, as he perhaps appeared as professor of mathematics, Lucasian professor of mathematics, as he was from um, 1669 in Cambridge. Um, and another man whose picture I can't show you. So I've done the next best thing, which is to show you his signature. Uh, so this works, let me find it, this man here. John Wickens. And uh, that's his signature uh, from the book recording people's admission as fellows of Trinity College in Cambridge. Newton's signature is on a slightly earlier page um, because uh, Wickens became 
a fellow in 1668 and Newton became a fellow in 1667. So these are two people who are contemporaries in their same, the same Cambridge College. And um, so that, oops, that gets us to this, which is a notebook, the notebook that I want to talk to you about, which is um, about the same size as many of Newton's pocket notebooks, um, although it's rather more finely bound than any of Newton's no notebooks, um, certainly than the waste book, which you can see on the right hand side there. Um, but um, this is the book which I went to look at in March 2021. Um, and it was described, so I went I went to Bonham's auction house in Knightsbridge, um, having been asked to come and have a look at it uh, by the auctioneers, who described it as being a manuscript notebook of John Wickens, died 1719, that's correct, Wickens died on the 19th of December 1719, friend, collaborator and amanuensis of Isaac Newton, that's also correct, uh, bearing ownership inscription on front end paper, J. Wickens Trinity College, Cambridge, that's possibly not correct, um, late 17th century, uh, and then with uh, a quotation, which we'll see. Um, so I turned up at that door um, behind the tree, and I had a problem because the door was shut, and at that stage I didn't own a mobile phone, and there was no doorbell. So I went round the side and rattled the doors and waited for the police to come and arrest me for breaking the lockdown. And then a little bit, little bit later, someone turned up with some large brass pans that he wanted Bonhams to auction, and they let me in as well. And I went up and I had a look at the look at the book. So let's have a little bit, little bit further look at, at what Bonhams said about it. Um, so we've been through most of this. Uh, what does the book contain? It contains, allegedly, transcripts. Now that's a very interesting term, isn't it? Of two commonplace lectures or sermons noted in another hand as given by Newton at Trinity College, Cambridge. So we've got potentially two or three hands of this manuscript already now. Um, so transcripts of um, some lectures on Romans, uh, commonplaces, that means lectures given in the context usually in Trinity College Chapel of procession through the um, hierarchy of degrees and fellowship and so on uh, on the subject whatsoever is not of faith is sin and a further essay in Latin on morality well we'll hear a bit more about that one soon the volume ending with copies of some letters from my chamber fellow Mr Isaac Newton when I was at Monmouth comprising transcripts of three letters sent to Wickens by your very loved and chamber fellow, Isaac Newton from Cambridge. Uh, such a notebook is referred to in a letter from Wickens' son, Nicholas, to Robert Smith, Plumian Professor of Natural Philosophy at Trinity, dated 16th of January, 1728, Keynes Manuscript 137. That's a manuscript bought by Maynard Keynes in the sale of material from the uh, residue of manuscripts of Isaac Newton owned by the family of the Earl of Portsmouth, the Wallop family, uh, that was put up for sale, having been rejected, oh joy, by the University of Cambridge in the 1870s, and was put up for sale in 1936. And thanks to Maynard Keynes, about a third of it went to Cambridge, uh, to King's College, where that latter is, and the rest is all over the world, including in California. Um, the handwriting, according to Bonhams, is the handwriting of Mr. John Wickens. The manus uh, however, note in the catalogue, the manuscript usually ascribed to him does bear substantial differences to the hand in our notebook. So we go back to where we started. Is this a manuscript by Isaac Newton or is it something else? And uh, is it a forgery or something else that someone would love to know? So that is the letter. Um, from Nicholas Wickens to Robert Smith, 
uh, written at Stoke Edith, a place that uh, has extensive connections with the Wiccans family because several generations were rectors of Stoke Edith, which is a little place in Herefordshire, um, and describing, mentioning in it um, a, basically saying to Smith, I haven't really got anything that has any connection with Isaac Newton, despite the fact that my father was his chamber fellow, but I do find that I, I have a little, I find very little under Sir Isaac's own hand, uh, et cetera, et cetera, but um, that he finds that he has uh, a small notebook that was kept by his father. Um, and just sort of to add to the puzzle, we then have this note describing it, um, quoting from a 19th century life of Newton uh, and referring to also to this letter um, written in yet another hand. So, some more hands. So that's the signature, according to Bonhams. J. Wickens, Trinity College, Cambridge. Well, could be, might not be. You make your mind up, tell me whether you agree with me. Um, there's um, another 19th century hand. So we've definitely got um, something going on here. And there we have um, a page of the notebook. And there we have the manuscript with which to which Bonhams compared it. Now this manuscript, which is um, is in the Cambridge University Library because it was deposited, manuscript on the right-hand side, was deposited in the library um, by Newton uh, as proof of the fact that he's been doing his job. So slight problem if you're Newton. So if you're the occasion professor of mathematics, you're supposed to give lectures regularly and um, you're not trusted that you're going to do this because of course no one will come to your lectures, which is indeed what happened in to Newton's lectures. So you're asked to deposit um, the proof that you've given your lectures. And there are in fact two copies of the this particular set of lectures in the Cambridge University Library now. There's the retained copy from which Newton probably gave the lectures, which is in the Portsmouth papers that were acquired in, 18, in the 1870s. And there is this copy, which was deposited in Newton's lifetime as proof of the fact that he'd been doing his job. So, um, and in Newton's scholarship, um, so recondite is it that we actually can, can sort of, one can say this sort of thing. Um, this manuscript is usually referred to, indeed, by anyone who's identified it, as being written by John Wickens. So this is, this is John Wickens' hand, we are told. And it will immediately strike you, even those of you who can't actually see the manuscript, so that probably is about rows three back, um, <laughs> that the hand is not the same. So um, here we have a nice example of an auction house um, happily telling you that they are auctioning a manuscript kept by um, a manuscript of unknown writing by Isaac Newton in an unidentified and unknown hand, which is not like the hand of the manuscript to which they have compared it. And which contains texts, moreover, which no one has ever seen and no one thinks has anything, no one in the past has thought had anything to do with Newton except for the writer of this manuscript. So, that's good um, because um, it means that there's a little bit of work to do. So um, this is another piece of handwriting which has been thought to be by John Wickens. Um, and you can see that it doesn't work either. So that's good. 
But here is another piece of handwriting. This is part of the manuscripts which were collected together um, of Newton's optical writings that eventually became the drafts from which Newton composed the optics in 1704. So he'd been working on optical material from the, well, from the 1660s, early 1670s onwards, mm -hmm. and um, brought materials together uh, which he then converted into the text of the optics, um, beginning in the late 1680s, early 1690s, and then with a pause, and then finished off just before the book was published in 1704. Um, and I thought this handwriting actually looked quite similar to the handwriting on uh, the left, so to the notebook. So potentially there is an amanuensis whose hand appears in the Newton papers um, and whose hand looks like the hand of the notebook. And this is um, a letter in the same hand, uh, which again, I think looks quite like the hand of the notebook. Um, and I'll give you some more samples to look at. So I'm a no. Um, slight problem here is that I've had to blow the notebook up. So the handwriting is, is, is larger. It's normally much the same size, but there are a lot of very similar letter forms if you start, start looking and uh, you, keep, you keep looking, you can see more, le more similar letter forms and relatively few letter forms that are unrepresented in uh, both <laughs> manuscripts, bearing in mind that one of them is a letter, which is quite small, quite a small sample. So I was very pleased when I found this which is uh, a letter from, well, which is the letter I've just shown you being referred to in a letter that Newton wrote to Edmund Halley on the 27th of July, 1686. Yesterday, I unexpectedly struck upon a copy of the letter I told you of to Hugenius, that is to Christian Halkins. Tis in the hand of Mr. John Wickens, who was then my chamber fellow and is now a parson of Stoke Edith near Monmouth. And so it is authentic. Now, this is very nice because it tells me firstly that I can identify Wickens's hand. Wickens's hand is the hand of the writer, the amanuensis who wrote that letter, that letter to Christian Hawkins. And secondly, Newton himself says, things written in Wickens's hand are authentic. So those are things that I've written. So this made me very happy um, because it made me feel that I could believe that this manuscript might have been written by someone who might have known Isaac Newton, or actually who did know Isaac Newton, and in fact lived in the same rooms as Isaac Newton. Between certain dates, and here there's also some uncertainty, when did Wickens and Newton actually live together and why were they living together? I should say living together means simply that they shared a room. It doesn't mean anything more significant than that. Um, and they evidently also shared some work with one another. But still, I thought, thought this was good. This, this made me feel reasonably confident. Um, oh, and that was something the last time I gave this talk, I just found Robert Hooke's copy of this letter. So this is an important enough letter. We don't have it in Newton's handwriting, but we have it in Wickens's handwriting. And Robert Hooke thought in, made sure he got a copy of it at some point. Um, now, at the back of um, the, you'll recall the manuscript contains three things. It contains a sermon on Romans. It contains uh, an unidentified Latin text on morality, which we'll come on to in a minute, um, and which is in fact the reason why it must be Newton, regardless of the handwriting. Um, and it contains three letters. And those letters tell us a little bit about the relationship between um, Newton and Wickens, and fill in some previously unknown facts 
about that relationship. Um, they also had the absolutely wonderful effect of putting people off buying this manuscript, which was very good for the University <laughs> of Cambridge <laughs> Library. And that was because Bonhams, as you will recall, said three unpublished letters of Isaac Newton. Um, well, my friend Anka Timmerman, uh, who was the bookseller who bought the manuscript, um, is much cleverer at Google searches than many people, including me. And she managed to find out that these letters were not unpublished. They are not not unpublished in the sense that they appear in the published editions of Newton's correspondence, where they do not appear, but they were published in the Athenaeum magazine uh, in the late 19th century by a man called W.R. Wilson, who we will come back to again in a little while. So we had wonderful fun of a sale room notice correction. Three unpublished letters by Newton are not unpublished. They have been published, which made it much, um, well, probably put one or two people off bidding for this jolly strange manuscript with lots of question marks around it, including whose hand is it in? Why doesn't it, isn't it in the same hand as the persons who it's attributed to and all the rest. So um, how wonderful um, the digitizing of 19th century newspapers is. Um, I have been working on Isaac Newton for 30, 30 years or so. Um, I have colleagues who've been working on Isaac Newton for rather longer than that, and we had none of us found this publication, um, but Anka managed to, so that was very clever of her. Um, now, um, Mr. Wilson, so who are these, these handwritings here? Well, um, the handwriting in the, in the beginning of the book turns out to be the handwriting of a later owner. Surprise, surprise. Um, a later owner who's, who helps us put together the provenance of the book. Um, that later owner is a man called Edward, Edmund Verney. And uh, Edmund Verney lived in a place called Plas Rianfa. And he employed W.R. Wilson, superintendent of the British Museum's reading room, to catalogue his library. And on the top right, you can see the catalogue entry for this book. So in the late 19th century, uh, this book was undoubtedly known and was in the hands of the Verney family at Plas Rianfa. And they thought, unsurprisingly actually, because David Brewster had thought in the biography that he published of Newton, um, in uh, the mid 19th century. And he thought it because he'd read that letter by um, Nicholas Wilkins, uh, Wickens rather, Nicholas Wickens, that this was um, a manuscript uh, connected with Newton. So how did it get to Plas Rianfa? Well, it got there through the will of John Wickens, who died in 1719, who divided his library in half. And he shared his library uh, with two of his children. And um, this notebook descended from his, from the father, John Wickens, to the son, Nicholas Wickens, 1689 to 1773, who, as we've already seen, succeeded his father as rector of Stoke Edith. Uh, it was then probably inherited by Nicholas Wickens' son, Thomas Wickens, 1729 to 1787, uh, whose will you can see here, and then to his son, also Thomas Wickens, 1767 to 1842. It then went to the owner or the builder of Plas Rianfa, Sir John Hope Williams, then to his daughter, Margaret Maria Hay Williams, 1844 to 1930, who married in 1868, Edmund Hope Verney, 1838 to 1910, whose hand, as we've seen, is found on a modern piece of a piece of modern paper, which is pasted into the front of the notebook. So then, so there we can uh, 
provide a provenance for this book, which nicely goes back to John Wickens. But those letters of Newton in this book are to John Wickens at Monmouth, not surprisingly enough, John Wickens, whose bed is next door to mine in a chamber in Cambridge. Um, and that is because um, Wickens was uh, in the late 1670s, was no longer resident in Cambridge. He was instead taking part in a huge fight in the Welsh border town of Monmouth, where he had been uh, preferred to uh, a job as a uh, town preacher by one of the London livery companies, and uh, where the inhabitants wanted somebody else as their town preacher. Uh, and that nicely generates all sorts of controversy, which one can trace um, in this case, in a manuscript in the Bodleian, and which led eventually to Wickens being um, sacked and to his taking up instead the rectory of Stoke Edith uh, under the patronage of the Foley family, who are big landowners in that part of the world and who continued to patronise the people. So Wickens, who was thought possibly to have left Cambridge in the early 1680s, actually left Cambridge in the late 1670s, but he carried on corresponding with Newton just as he carried on being on the books of Trinity College. And um, he corresponded with Newton in these letters about such interesting things as how you can obtain the iron to make better telescopes and how you can also obtain the iron in order to um, conduct certain chemical, well, chemical experiments that allow you to make better mirrors for telescopes. Um, and um, one of the things revealed in these letters very nicely uh, is a relationship between Wickens, who had been uh, Newton's chamber fellow when Newton uh, sent his reflecting telescope to the Royal Society. Um, here you can find them making uh, corresponding with one another about the making of a new and previously unknown uh, two-foot reflecting telescope, um, which um, Newton and Newton is discussing with Wickens both the materials he needs to make it and the manufacturers he might use in London, um, and in particular um, this man, um, Mr Cooper. Uh, who is probably um, a member of um, the instrument makers company called John Cooper uh, and who um, Newton was going to approach to cast the metal to, and to polish it to make the reflecting miller, mirror for his new uh, telescope. So we have um, some interesting facts about Newton, not only that he is carrying on doing optical work in the late 1670s, carrying on making, making uh, new instruments, but also um, that that collaboration between Newton and Wickens uh, that's reflected in the copying of uh, the manuscripts which are to do with correspondence and um, uh, the debates around Newton's first optical publications is an intellect, a shared intellectual pursuit, uh, which carried on over a long period. So that those people who think that Newton never talked to anyone about his uh, intellectual interests are perhaps over-egging the pudding. But what are those letters mostly about? The letters are actually mostly about reading and they're mostly about theological reading. Uh, and uh, they therefore look back to the second text in the book. And this is the text that shows that whatever else this manuscript is, it was certainly a manuscript that, it, that uh, began its life in the closest circles of Newton's activity. Uh, because the, um, as we will see, this text uh, this Latin text, which isn't strictly speaking about morality, it's um, actually about uh, divine predestination, and it's about arguments against people who would deny um, the doctrine of the Trinity and uh, 
the reality of divine predestination um, is uh, a manuscript preserving um, the very words that Newton spoke at an event uh, that he had had to um, take part in uh, a couple of years uh, before the letters were written. Um, and um, again, the background to this is um, Newton's um, not being ordained or being ordained. Well, no, it's not really. It's, the background to this is the politics of the University of Cambridge, which have been to a certain extent misunderstood by people who write about Newton's religion. So Richard S. Westfall, the greatest biographer of Isaac Newton, uh, whose marvelous Never at Rest was published in 1980, um, talks about Newton's decision not to be ordained. And he suggests that as part of preparation for ordination, Newton read the fathers and that it did not take him long to read himself right out of orthodoxy and into what Westfall describes as, as Arianism. Well, um, this document casts some doubt on those conclusions because the words of Newton represented here are all perfectly orthodox, although the reading is certainly reading of anti of Arian and anti sorry of anti Trinitarian texts, um, not so much Arian as Sicinian, and the context for reading those things um, is a context provided by this man, Joseph Beaumont, Master of Peterhouse and Professor of Divinity in the University of Cambridge. And yeah. Beaumont and his colleagues had started to worry about the orthodoxy of people who were studying at Cambridge and thought that the way to solve this problem was to enforce a rule that required people who had been masters of arts for a particular period of time to perform publicly in front of the professor uh, in um, an activity called the Divinity Act. And Beaumont kept records of those performances of the determinations in the Divinity Act. And uh, a copy of those records you can see on the right hand side, uh, which shows that um, the two topics that uh, Newton disputed uh, in front of Beaumont, um, the first one, um, on the morality of human actions and the way in which it does not uh, affect the future of their souls, and the second one on the cult of the Eucharist according to Roman Catholics. And Newton conducted that, uh, performed at the Divinity Act on the 8th of February 1677, so a couple of years before the letters to Wiccans which describe theological reading were written. Um, and here you can see Beaumont's own copy of the determinations that were made in the Divinity Act, and they include an exchange between Newton and Beaumont. They include Beaumont's response, so what Beaumont said at the end of the conclusion of the debates in the Act, and some questions that he asked Newton as a performer in the Act. Those questions make sense in the context of the text in this manuscript. They are responses to the previously unknown text in this manuscript. So this manuscript contains the words that Newton spoke in the Divinity Act in 1677. Incidentally, Newton's performance at the Divinity Act was also unknown until a couple of years ago when I published about it on the basis of Bowman's manuscripts. But this is therefore the longest piece of Newton's speech that we have evidence of. There is no other verbatim record of Newton talking other than in this manuscript. And so that's also quite a nice discovery. And since it's a text that we know Newton delivered, but of which whose content is unknown, 
But since it also agrees with the text on which these questions were asked in a manuscript which was unknown to anyone except people like me who happen to be lucky enough to have piles of manuscripts that Peter has that no one has read, um, this, this new notebook cannot be any form of forgery because it invents a text that really existed that nobody could have possibly invented in that form uh, if they had been trying to imagine it. So it's it it this 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 what I literally fell off my chair in Bonhams when I when I saw this um, and I thought oh dear um, how do I keep a straight face um, which I did um, uh, but um, there was nobody in the world other than me who would have recognised this um, text on morality for what it was which was. Um, Newton speaking at the Divinity Act in 1677. Um, and uh, that's more of the same. Uh, and then um, the correspondence, which talks about Newton's reading, uh, is very interesting as well, because Wickens had to perform in the Divinity Act um, a year or so later than Newton. Um, and the correspondence is about what should you read in order to have a basic understanding of contemporary divinity. And it shows Newton writing to Wickens in Monmouth and saying, these are the books that I'd read. These are the books that I could get for you. And this is what I'd recommend. And they include many books which were not ever in Newton's library. And they include in what they in fact show Newton was doing was going into his college library and reading the new acquisitions and reading them even before they had been catalogued in some cases. Um, in one case, he never owned a copy of one of the books that was particularly interesting to him, but he owned a manuscript copy of it, which he presumably had made from the printed copy he'd read. Um, in, um, many, many cases you can show that the edition he's telling Wickens about is not an edition of uh, the Church Fathers, which he later owned, Newton later owned many editions of the Church Fathers, is not a book that was in, let's say, Isaac Barrow's library, where it's been said Newton perhaps read, but is a book which was in Trinity College Library. Now, this is perhaps not very surprising. Uh, except for the fact that we're always told that nobody ever read anything in college libraries in 17th century Cambridge and that you know, coll colleges just sort of got books at random. Well, Newton was certainly reading regularly in his college library and thinking very hard here about set tasks in the university. This is not a fame, this is not a notebook that records the work of a famous man. This is a notebook that comes out of a setting in a very, very particular place at a very particular time, out of a very individual relationship between two people who share space together uh, and who also have to perform various rituals in the university. And it's about their relationship and their, also their shared intellectual interests. It's a very different uh, view of Newton. So Newton in the 1670s, early 1680s, is writing to this man, Wickens, with whom he shares these social and intellectual ideas uh, and setting. Wickens goes off and spends his life in um, an obscure country parish. Newton uh, becomes the most famous mathematician in the world in 1687 on the publication of the Principia and in the 1690s leaves for London. Wickens may have written um, drafts for Newton. They may have corresponded briefly, but as his son uh, said in response to Robert Smith, I don't have very much in Newton's hand from my father to do with my father. Well, that's true. He didn't really have anything in Newton's hand. He had a notebook his father kept of things Newton had written and things that his father had copied 
from things Newton had written that we no longer otherwise have. He also had at least two books that Newton had sent him long after um, the early 1680s and long after Wickens had left Cambridge for the last time. He goes off Trinity's books in 1683-4. On the top is John Wickens's copy of the first edition of the Principia with an inscription in Wickens's hand saying it was the gift of the author. Um, this is in a library, not in the United Kingdom, not in the United States. Um, and it came, I've discovered it only quite recently. From the same source from Place Rianfer, Bonham's auction, the book underneath, uh, which was in the other half of Wickens's library, not the half that went to um, Nicholas, but to his brother. Uh, and that, again, with the same ex dono inscription in John Wickens's hand, possibly with his signature, um, is the second edition of the Principia, published in 1713. Bearing in mind Wickens died in 1719, I think we can assume, therefore, that the two men remain friends, even though if there are other letters between them, they must be in a different notebook, which we haven't yet found. Thank you very much. Let me let me run up here real fast to, to help you take some questions. No, no, you get to stay right there. Um, we're going to take some questions. We have some time here, and let's go with John. Uh, no, there is no picture. Of, there, there is no picture of John Wickens, which is why I had to show you a signature. But I also showed you that so that those of you who have very good visual memories could decide whether or not you thought that the 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 J Wickens um, TCC or Cant or whatever it's or TC Cant or whatever it says at the front was in his hand, which I'm not absolutely sure it is. Was it Wickens himself who assembled all of these documents and bound them? Or did somebody else put it all together as a book? It, it's a single book written, in my view, in Wickens's hand on, um, I mean, I think, uh, let me just put it me out. Um, bound in what looks looks to me very well preserved but contemporary uh, contemporary binding. Um, rather a smart binding, but as I say, compared with, with most of Newton's notebooks. Uh, so Wickens obviously copied these out thinking they meant something to him. Um, and um, the paper is uniform throughout the book. Uh, the paper is plausibly um, of the right date. Um, it's a little bit difficult because it's the format of the book means that the watermark is right in the gutter of the book. But but I'm I'm reasonably confident that the paper is contemporary with Wickens. The book is contemporary. Obviously, these are copies. So um, I mean, I think. It's, they look to me as if they were all copied pretty much at the same time. Um, they don't. There doesn't seem to be a huge variation in uh, either the hand or the ink. There's a little bit of usage of um, the versa of the page to put extra information in, which makes me suspect that it's not an. In, I mean, uh, it's. There's a suggestion that, that, as it were, the person copying it had had the materials in front of him and occasionally sort of decided he wanted to put something there rather than something than at the end, let's say, of what he was copying. Um, and I assume that what happened was that well, that Wickens um, made these copies because, again, in some correspondence that we don't have, Newton asked for the return of his papers. That would also explain why Wickens' son didn't have 
correspondence of Newton and things like that, but he could he could tell um, people who were collecting information for Newton to write Newton's biography after he died about. We have a couple more here, David in the front, and then we'll go in the back. Uh, in the end, what did Cambridge pay the thirty one hundred? Um, now can I remember? Um, well, it all the I mean, you know, you have to pay auctioneers' commissions and things like that. What What do you think would be a good price, <laughs> <laughs> Rachel? What do you think would be a good price? <laughs> well, roughly ballpark. Absolutely have the Mandelbrot writer. Yeah, well, if you know what the university library knew when it bid, which is what I've told Did you. Did buy it at the auction? Yes. Anka bought it for the UL at the auction. Uh, six figures plus. I mean, for unpublished, original, verified, you six figures plus. 45,000 pounds. Oh, wait. No deal. Um, <laughs> Did that include the premium? No, that's before the premium. So that's just a hammer, but that doesn't tell us what we pay. Six, sixty seven yeah, or something. Right. right. Yeah. Um, well, it, I don't think it's too bad. <laughs> um, it was a lot. It was a lot less than I thought it would make, and I didn't think the UL would. I was hopeful they would buy it rather than certain they would be able to afford to buy it. But in the end, um, it's very good if you have several notices saying that you know, if auctioneers write things that say that um, they've identified the hand of someone by comparison with a manuscript that isn't in the same hand, that's, that's very helpful. Um, which you know, I mean, they it uh, this isn't to criticise Bonhams in any way at all. They were extremely helpful, very helpful to me. Um, it it's um, to reveal the fact that Newton scholarship had got that wrong, had got John Wickens completely wrong. For um, well, I mean, he's he's in all all Newton scholarship. His his relationship with Newton is known. The fact that he copied things for Newton is known. But no one had bothered to identify his hand, not even D.T. Whiteside, the greatest Newton scholar and the greatest scholar of Newton's manuscripts. Who catalogued the church bottoms? Was it Baptist? Um, I, I, I know, but I'm not going to say. Let's do one more question back here. And maybe uh, observations. One is that uh, um, this, is, this is such a poignant story about Cambridge in that era of the, you know, the skyrocketing scholar and the one left behind. I mean, I, I know you want to, I know that's part of the problem with what you're thinking about. It's just, and I think it's probably not an unusual story of, uh, you know, you think of these Cambridge graduates as going on to great things, many of them end up in very obscure carriages, or they're in the Society of the Propagation of the Gospel in Barbados, or um, uh, and there's you know this his old friend zooming to international indelible fame. I mean, it's quite a story. The, the other thing I just sort of wondered is, I it seems as if would you say maybe this is, is my question? Newton's a curiosity about religion and his somewhat of his abandonment of it. Is that what's going? Is that what you're witnessing here? Is that he's seeking out something here? He's seeking information. He goes to the library, seeking, he's seeking, he's seeking, and ultimately, it's meaningless to him. It, it, am I exaggerating? Um, well, two, two. Okay, so two parts. Yeah. Newton, Newton, Newton was Newton the success and Wickens the failure, and then um, what? What does the stuff about religion tell you? Um, Wiggins was a success. Okay. He he had preferment from a major landowning and political family that he was able to pass down to his children. That's success. B 
being a Cambridge University professor is not success. <laughs> <laughs> no different now from the 17th century. Um, and um, so, yes, Newton eventually becomes a moderately successful middle-ranking public servant, but he is, uh, no, um, his, the normal career for people like Newton would have been to be ordained, would have been to seek the kind of patronage as the kind that Wiccans had from the Foley family, would have been to uh, then progress in the church, possibly to come back to Cambridge, um, so to be master of Trinity College. I mean, this is sort of the career of Isaac Barrow, actually, who is his predecessor as Lucasian professor, first Lucasian professor. Um, and um, Newton doesn't do that because he doesn't get ordained for some reason or another. Now, um, Richard Westfall and indeed many other people have thought that Newton didn't get ordained because Newton was um, an anti-Trinitarian. Um, I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true because I don't think the dates work. Um, Newton is undoubtedly an anti-Trinitarian in the early 1690s. <laughs> And he undoubtedly has anti-Trinitarian friends, including people who give him some patronage in the 1690s. But all the evidence from the late 1670s and early 1680s is actually that Newton is not yet. Newton is, is, is working within um, orthodox frames of divinity. And indeed, the evidence from the end of Newton's life is that he's retreating from anti-Trinitarian positions, so that people who rather naively sort of said Newton was a good Christian, et cetera, et cetera, and have been poo-pooed by generations of Newton scholarship may actually, in some sense, have been more right than some of their critics. So Newton has a fluid position with regard to orthodoxy and heterodoxy. Um, he has a very um, reluctant position on certain forms of public uh, worship and certain forms of, and particularly very, very strong concerns about idolatry, um, which are entirely in keeping with the um, religious landscape of where he was brought up um, and with quarrels that take place, for example, in the church in Grantham uh, in the 1630s and 40s. Uh, when he, I mean, just before Newton was born. Um, but I think, I think that there is a more nuanced story of Newton's uh, religious development and of Newton's religious positioning to tell than the one which is sometimes told. I, I, well, okay, one more, and then we'll have to wrap it up. So Could one more question. Have any of them come back? Is there a chance of any of them coming back again? Uh, what this first page is, sorry. But some of the pages for the university Oh, um the ah, oh, I see, yes. So um so Newton's Newton's the materials that were in Newton's possession when he died are inherited by his his heirs, Catherine Barton and her husband John Conduit, and then by their heirs. And um as I said, the first lot, I mean, they were all sent up to Cambridge in the 1860s. Cambridge was allowed to keep what it wanted to keep. It's not clear whether it could have kept everything, but it certainly could have kept more than it did. It kept certain things, then sent the rest back to personal items to the then Earl of Portsmouth. His, go down a couple of generations, his heir, Viscount Limington, put them up for sale at Sotheby's in 1936. And that's how those papers were dispersed. Some of them bought, as I said, by Maynard Keynes. Those are in Cambridge. Some of them bought by other collectors. Major collection is in Jerusalem. Um, the, um, there's a very large bundle of papers that made their way to the, uh, through the Clark family to the William Andrews Clark Library. 
Uh, there are a few other strays around the place. There are loads and loads of single sheets because they went into the book trade and the book trade did what the book trade does best, which is um, distribute. <laughs> and um, it, they, they distributed them very, very, very effectively. So they, they, they went, and, but most of them are now in, most but not all are now in institutions. Um, which is why there is still a market in Newton's papers. You will see things, sheets of Newton's handwriting occasionally, even letters occasionally, even unpublished letters occasionally come up on the market, uh, but usually only one or two sheets at a time, very, very small scraps. Um, so um, there is a, there is a, and the things that are in other institutions will never, I mean, Cambridge, and Cambridge doesn't buy because a sheet of Newton's handwriting is now by and large worth, um, well, if it's good, if it's got a signature, if it's got any, any philosophical, um, scientific, mathematical content, six figures just for one sheet is not, would not now be uncommon. Um, in fact, I'm in a tiny little, piece of corrections, discussion and corrections of Principia that Newton shared with David Gregory in the 1690s was sold for one and a half million quite recently. So um, it's um, the mark, yeah, I mean, it's, the, the, the university library would not buy those sorts of things, but it, but it did want to buy this. Well, that impressive last comment, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up here. Um, and I'm going to say on behalf of the Book Club of California and the American Trust for the British Library and the Bibliographical Society of America, we all want to thank you for being with us. So let's have a big round of applause for our speakers. And then I also want to thank you all for coming out here in person to the Book Club tonight or joining us on Zoom. Uh, as a reminder, if you want more information about the Book Club of California, you can go to bccbooks.org. For more information about the Bibliographical Society of America, you can find that at bibsocamer.org. And more information about the American Trust of the British Library, you can, can be found at atbl.us. So thanks everyone for joining us. We hope to see you again at another book club program. Everyone have a wonderful night and take care. <laughs>